Hello everyone, welcome to today's live broadcast. Achieving reproducibility, don't let antibodies be available in your experiment. I'm Robert Castellanos of Labridge, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labridge and sponsored by Cell Signaling Technology. Cell Signaling Technology, CST, is a private family-owned company founded by scientists and dedicated to providing the world's highest quality innovative research and diagnostic products to accelerating biological understanding and enable personalized medicine. Our employees operate worldwide from our U.S. headquarters in Massachusetts and our offices in the Netherlands, China, and Japan. For more information, please visit CellSignal.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. The webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located at the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining credits. I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Anthony Kuvian. Dr. Kuvian has worked at Cell Signaling Technology for almost seven years in various capacities. As a product development scientist, he conceived, validated, and released over 100 antibody products. More recently, Dr. Kavian was in charge of the CST's unique post-transitional modification and motif antibody portfolio and has considerable experience in the protomedic space. Prior to joining CTS, Dr. Kavian earned his PhD in molecular physiology and biophysics at Vanderbilt University and spent many years as a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard Medical School. He has dedicated much of his career using infinity-based methods and assays. Currently, Covian is responsible for coordinating CST's antibody reproducibility efforts, working with both internal and external scientists to ensure the CST meets or exceeds the industry standards for antibody validation. I'll now turn it over to the doctor for his presentation. Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, again, my name is Anthony Kuvion, and what I'd like to talk to you guys about today is um, how to use antibodies and what CST's take is on antibody validation and reproducibility. Um, and the way I'd like to do that is first talk a little bit about CST, about myself, um, and why you should even believe what I'm telling you today, but then go back a little bit and talk about the reasons uh, for why reproducibility is an important topic, uh, what the causes are, uh, who's responsible, CST's role in, in validation and reproducibility, and then discuss a little bit about what's being done to address the problem, not only from CST's perspective, but also from uh, the NIH uh, and other players. And at the end, we'll uh, uh, take some questions. As we just heard, CST is a private global company. It was founded by a, a group of uh, PhDs uh, from MGH and Harvard uh, with the goal in mind of generating reagents, useful reagents that researchers could use to enable preclinical discovery. Um, CST is focused on application-driven antibody validation. Um, we put a lot of effort into quality control and our tech support. Internally, we've developed three generations of rabbit monoclonal technologies, um, and that it leads us to be able to generate recombinant rabbit monoclonal antibodies uh, directly from polyclonals, um, and that's our latest technology. As a matter of fact, 95% of our rabbit monoclonal antibodies are indeed recombinant. We do all of our manufacturing in-house. That is 100% of the antibodies that we sell are manufactured right here in Danvers, Massachusetts in an ISO 9001 certified facility. Um, and we develop over 95% of our products. 
just briefly a little bit about me, um, just so you know where I'm coming from in this area. I've, I've been working in labs for a very, very long time. Um, first as a research associate, uh, then as a graduate student and a postdoctoral fellow, like many of you, I'm sure, have. Now, the interesting thing about this is that every time I've worked in one of these fields, I've been in very antibody-dependent labs. Um, everything from you know studying serine threonine kinases at, at Harvard to um, G proteins and GPCRs uh, at Vanderbilt during my graduate career. And the thing that always struck me in, in each of these studies, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is that oftentimes antibodies are one of the limiting steps in, in, in your hypothesis-driven research. Um, either there's issues with uh, lack of availability of a specific antibody, um, the, the specificity of the antibody that you buy from a vendor, uh, or it's not clear exactly if the antibody works for the application you're interested in, um, or you, know, you transition from being a graduate student to a postdoctoral fellow and you change methodology, so you're using uh, techniques that you're no longer uh, familiar with. Uh, in my case, I went from never doing flow cytometry to doing almost exclusively flow cytometry. And there was a learning curve in there and understanding how to use antibodies that had been used widely by others and that I just couldn't get uh, to work in my own hands. The bottom line was that, you know, I spent two years of my life in graduate school using an antibody uh, from a company that uh, turned out to be nonspecific. And part of the fault was mine for not taking the time up front to validate the antibody to make sure that it was specific up front. But oftentimes, as many of you know, when you're in a lab and, and your, your boss is asking you to, to churn out data for a publication or whatnot, you trade off production um, over taking that second step um, and wanting to make sure that the reagent is correct. Um, and so part of the reason that I came to CST uh, and one of the reasons that many folks are here is because We've all had that experience. We've all been in a lab where we've worked with an antibody that has turned out to be incorrect, and you end up wasting time, uh, resource, uh, and your own sanity um, in order to uh, you know, get your experiments to work. So in coming to CST, like I said, I've been here for seven years. Uh, much of that time has been spent doing antibody development, um, and that's everything from selecting the targets to uh, assisting with the design of the antigen to doing all the validation work that goes into producing a product that then is, is bought by our customers. And so I'm showing here just a few examples of the antibodies that I've developed. Um, I've developed probably over 100 antibodies, um, mostly in the MAP kinase calcium signaling uh, space, but a few outliers in there as well. Um, and in every case, I was didn't want a, a student or a user of my products to have to go through the issues that I went through. So everything that I did and everything that we do here at CST is all about ensuring that um, we make the highest quality product possible. Um, we want people to be able to use our antibodies right out of the box as they would expect uh, them to work. So part of the problem with reproducibility is the way that we choose antibodies. And the way that I see it is that there are a few different options when you're first looking for an antibody. You can go to the scientific literature and try to see uh, how an antibody was used. And you and I all know that there are two issues you face, right? The first is that you find the manuscript uh, using Google Scholar or PubMed and you, you locate the, 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 the antibody, the experiment you want to use, and the authors don't actually cite it. Or my favorite case, of course, is the one where they they say, oh, it was used exactly, it was used in the previous paper, you hunt the previous paper down, they then reference another paper, and so on and so forth. Um, and so one of the problems with the scientific literature is that there are no citations, uh, the methods are incomplete, or there's no details about the antibody that was used. Um, the other place you can go is to uh, look at producers' websites. Um, and as many of you have probably known, uh, Producers either don't offer the product, or it's very difficult to understand how they validated the antibody. Uh, companies can show data, um, but data showing staining in a, in a cell is not validation. That's just showing you that the antibody detects something. It doesn't tell you exactly what it is. And some companies do a better job than others 
of showing that kind of validation data. Um, at CST, we hope that we're extremely transparent. We're not perfect, but as we go, we do a, do a better and better job of showing exactly the data, uh, exactly the systems that were used to validate the antibody, and I'll discuss that in a lot more detail in the future. One thing to be cautious of, and, and something that's kind of popped up more and more lately, are the presence of resellers. So if you often go to BioCompare or any other antibody search engine, a lot of times the places that pop up are companies that are just reselling other companies' products. Um, and they don't ever make it clear, unless the clone name is the same, that the product is exactly the same uh, as what another company is offering. So we've heard from uh, many, many different customers that when they set out to do a new product project, um, if they want to stain uh, a, a new target by IHC, for example, they'll go out and they'll buy five or six different antibodies from five or six different companies and they'll, they'll test them out. The reality is that depending on the target, three or four of those antibodies could be exactly the same product, formulated slightly differently, but basically you're being resold the same product in a rebranded way. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of caution that needs to be used when purchasing antibodies from what I will call a non-producer or a reseller. There are also search engines uh, and aggregators that you can use to look up antibody information, antibody resource, Google, um, Antibodypedia, for example, um, and there are a lot more and more of these that are coming out. And I think that these are beginning to be a really useful uh, resource for people to find antibodies. Uh, BioCompare is probably one of the most used. Um, but a lot of times what you have to realize with these sites is that the vendors are paying for placement of uh, some of these, this information on their sites. And so the top results that turn up are, are not always the best antibodies, they're just the first ones that were listed. A lot of these sites do have reviews, which I think are helpful, but you have to use caution when, when doing that. Do the reviews show data, for example? The other thing is, and, and we've seen this as well, is that some of these sites um, will often aggregate the data from a bunch of different vendors so that you can never quite tell which data is associated with which antibody. And I think that that's confusing and creates a problem. You can also often reach out to your colleagues and peers, and similar to reaching to digging into the science of literature, the problem that you have is that people may not remember exactly which antibody they used. Uh, more importantly, they not re may not remember which lot they used, and there are variations, especially with polyclonal antibodies, from lot to lot. And so you have to be really careful of that. So why is this important? Um, it, some of you may be familiar with um, the Global Biological Standards Institute, um, which is headed by Len Friedman. And Dr. Friedman did a really interesting study with a group of economists uh, a few years back in which they looked at scientific reproducibility in the preclinical environment and made some estimates, uh, both uh, bottom up and top down, to try to understand how much of academic research is not reproducible. And they found, they estimated based on a number of studies that over 50% of all preclinical research is not reproducible. That amounts to a, a waste of $28.2 billion in NIH funding that's given to academic researchers every year. Now, that 50% number may vary. Other studies have shown it to be higher. Other studies have shown it to be lower. But in general, 50% is a, is a pretty good estimate of how irreproducible research is. And it's not clear how much of that is due to antibodies. But for the most part, what, the, what Len Freeman's group found was that biological reagents and materials were probably the largest fraction due of waste. And that is everything from identification of the reagent, incorrect reagents, bad reagents, poorly validated reagents, reagents used in the, in the wrong system. And they found that that made up the bulk of the waste, uh, bulk of the cause for irreproducible research. They also found that investigators who didn't set their studies up properly or cherry-picked data or didn't do enough biological replicates also contributed pretty highly to that number. So study design and the data analysis and report out were also a large chunk of, of that re irreproducible research. And then finally, the use of protocols. And that is that 
protocols that are not completely written or don't document everything or um, are just in somebody's head um, were the cause of uh, the, the, the smallest cause, but still a significant cause of that lack of reproducibility. And so this is important because the research that's done in the preclinical pre environment is what drives the discoveries that go on in the clinical environment. And so if the, the information that's being developed in a preclinical phase of a research project is mistaken or incorrect or incomplete, then it means that we're slower getting to, a, to cures, we're slowly, slower getting to discoveries, or worse yet, we're actually making um, bad diagnostics, bad therapeutics based on incorrect data. And, and there has been a history of, of this happening. So a couple of recent studies, again, one from the GBSI and, and another one from Monia Baker's group uh, at Nature, did a series of surveys. And out of those surveys of, of scientists, research scientists, um, they found that there were a number of causes, uh, general causes, that contributed to um, irreproducibility within the lab. And in order of I've listed them in order of importance here. So the survey results indicated that incomplete reporting of data was uh, the number one, uh, and that means cherry picking information. Reagent variability and lack of validation were number two and number three. And reagent variability is uh, lot to lot consistency, resellers consistency, people using uh, different versions of the same thing or not knowing exactly what they're using or not doing validation. Um, and so that's, that's a really big problem if those two things are, are right up there at the top. Experimental bias also came up, uh, people not understanding how to do enough biological replicates, doing uh, experiments without statistical basis, or selectively reporting the results made up a large chunk of the, of the issue as well. Um, but then again, there was, uh, it was an incorrect interpretation and misconduct were by far the smallest factors in this. So what it really came down, comes down to, at least for me and, and cell signaling, is that we can break all of these down into three basic categories. And so the way we feel, and, and, and a couple of recent meetings would support this, uh, and I'll talk about those in a bit, is that really all of the issues come down to three problems inadequate training and support, little or no reagent identification or methods reporting, and poorly validated or misused antibodies. And at CST, we call those the three M's of reproducibility. And I'm going to walk through this very, very quickly. So we feel that reproducibility comes down to three things, methods, materials, and mentoring. And I'll talk about mentoring first. So CST feels that one of the biggest problems is that there's a lack of basic training, a lack of basic knowledge of antibodies. And we see this with our own tech support, which is that we have users call in that are just unfamiliar with how to use an antibody. And especially younger investigators, this was also reflected in the GBSI report, um, aren't familiar with how to validate an antibody or don't see the need to validate an antibody. And while the vendor should do a lot of that work for you, the bottom line is that you still need to validate the antibody in your own system, in your own hands, to make sure that it's going to work in your specific system. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. There seems to be a broad misunderstanding that an antibody that works by Western blot doesn't necessarily also work for IHC or another application. And if there's one message you take home from this webinar today, it's that Performance in one application does not pre predict performance in another. And so whenever you take an antibody and use it in a different application, you need to revalidate that antibody. And I'll talk about that in a lot more detail in a bit. And again, students uh, and scientists learning how to understand and interpret their data, set their data up, set their experiments up correctly, and using the same methods over and over again and understanding the difference between biological replicates and technical replicates was cited in uh, both studies as being a, a, a problem. Finally, we feel that tech support is a component of mentoring and that when you have an issue with a company's reagent, whether it be an antibody or anything else, you should be able to call that company and get help, um, whether it be you know, guidance 
a protocol, um, whatnot, that companies should play a role in that mentoring process. Methods, on the other hand, uh, fall mostly into uh, making sure that they're clear and detailed, they're complete, that they're available, traceable, and that they can be replicated or repeated. And this is really important, and I'll talk about this when I talk about the role of journals, uh, scientists, and vendors in this space in, in a slide. Finally, the materials that you use to do your experiments need to be highly validated. You need to use them properly, as I just alluded to, that an antibody performance in one experiment, in one application, doesn't predict how it'll perform in another. The materials need to be easily identified. Um, they need to be consistent, and that could be lot-to-lot -lot consistency, or that could be use-to-use -use consistency, and they need to be stable. And I'll talk about those concepts in a second. So who's responsible for each of these areas? And what I would argue is that principal investigators and their institutions should be responsible for the mentoring and methods component of the three M's. And that is that principal investigators and institutions should be training their students in statistical analysis, in how to set up experiments, in the proper use of reagents um, and protocols. And they need to be able to document those to show that they need to just teach basic good laboratory practices and keeping notebooks and things like that. And that if principal investigators and institutions played a greater role in here, there would be less of a reproducibility issue. We realize that this is difficult for a lot of uh, investigators to do. They're busy writing grants, et cetera. But still, we feel that this is an important initiative. And, and I think that coming into the future, there will be more and more effort by institutions to help train especially younger scientists. Scientists, or the people using the reagents, are responsible for the materials and methods. You could also argue they're somewhat responsible for mentoring those underneath them, but for this purpose, I'm going to make them predominantly responsible for the materials and methods. So the materials and methods means that you should, again, identify the materials that you're using, clearly document the protocols that you're using, and make sure that other people can replicate the experiments that you're doing. I think that that's very important. And the scientists are a little bit more careful with how they use reagents and how they document how they use reagents. Some of this reproducibility uh, situation will be mitigated. We also think that journals are ha complicit in ensuring that materials and methods are clearly documented and clearly identified um, in their journals. As I alluded to early on in the talk, there are all sorts of times in which you go to a journal there are clearly lots of Western blots in the article. There are clearly lots of Western blots in the article. Sorry, I think we've gone blank. There are clearly lots of Western blots in the article, and the the um, the uh, sorry, forgive me. There are lots of Western blots in the article, but nowhere are there citations indicated for the um, antibody. And so it's important that the journals establish rules and guidelines to show what you need to do to indicate properly cite and properly reference an antibody when you use it. At CST, we feel that CST itself and vendors are responsible for all three of the M's. And that is that we need to make sure that we carefully document our methods. We need to make sure that we clearly identify and make our the materials, the antibodies that we're providing you extremely consistent, and that we're providing you tech support, tech support so that we're mentoring and assisting with the experiment. And how do we do that? So at CST, we use application-driven antibody development, which means that all of the protocols that, that we show on our website have been optimized uh, for that application for that antibody. And we make those protocols those detailed protocols clearly available on our website in an app-specific manner. So that if you go to our website and you're using a specific product, you can find out more information. And we have significant data to show that even changing the percent of formaldehyde in the fixation conditions of an IHC or an IF experiment can have disastrous effects on the outcome of the experiment. And so we put a lot of effort into validating the products as we go and hope that our users can benefit from that by following those same protocols. We realize that's not always the case, 
But and that's where tech support comes in because oftentimes we've tested our antibodies under other conditions as well and can help provide some insight as to the effect of, say, using milk or BSA to block during the primary or to block or to use 4% paraformaldehyde versus 3% during the fixation step. When we provide our tech, technical support, we should be helping you understand why an antibody didn't work if it didn't work or how to improve your results. And sometimes that's as simple as providing a separate protocol, but other times that involves a lengthy troubleshooting process. We also have application experts so that, in other words, the people, when you call our tech support line, you're not directed to somebody um, who then routes your call. You're actually directed to the people who validated the antibody by that application. So if you have an IHC question, you talk to the IHC team. If you have an ELISA question, you talk to the ELISA team. We also offer a number of tutorials and application guides that should help uh, with commonly asked questions. We offer on-site training uh, for some of our more difficult applications, such as our proteomics work. And we collaborate widely with investigators, not only investigators developing new methods, but investigators who are trying to use our antibody for a method that, that we haven't validated the product. And we do this as a way of ensuring that our antibodies are handled and used in a way that's consistent with our own practices so that when other customers want to use the antibody in that method, they can, they can benefit from previous customers' work. The materials that CST makes are tested for specificity, sensitivity, reactivity, consistency, stability, and manufacturing. As I meant to mention earlier, we manufacture 100% of our antibodies in-house, which means that everything that goes out the door has been tested by one of our production teams. And I'll walk through that process in a minute. The stability issue is a big one I think most people aren't aware of, is that rabbit monoclonal antibodies, especially recombinant rabbit monoclonal antibodies, are pretty stable. However, before we send anything out the door, we store it at 37 degrees for one week to make sure that it performs as well before and, af and after it went into those conditions. And so, Many of our products are shipped according to their stability, and that's clearly indicated on the data sheet. From a consistency perspective, we test every lot of a new product in every, app in every approved application before the new lot is released. Um, and we make sure that old, the new lot looks just the same as the old lot when we release those products. And I'll show you an example of that in a bit. But first, I want to walk you through a little bit of what how we show data and all the processes we go through to validate antibodies in the hopes that you can start using some of these in your own lab to make decisions on purchasing antibodies, but then also save yourself time and effort when you're using an antibody in a new system. This is a typical data sheet. The same information is available on our webpage. But on this data sheet, we show information about the approved applications and the tested species that the antibody has been used in. And when we say approved applications, that means that here are the applications that we've tested this antibody in, and the antibody has passed. We don't indicate any applications that have failed or were not tested. If you need that information, you can call our, call our tech support line. And in the future, we will make that information available to users. We also indicate the species that the antibody works against. Some antibodies were able to test a large number of species. Others were only able to test a few. But by default, we always test in human, mouse, and rat and make that information available where possible. If we list a species in, in parentheses, it means that the antigen is 100% identical over that antigenic range. And we only list those species that are 100% identical. We don't make any assumptions. We also list the storage conditions. We list the applications, uh, additional information about the applications the dilution that the antibody was used, and the buffers. Now, one shortcoming that we realize is that many customers like to see the concentration of the antibody. We don't actually list that on our data sheets. We are going to start putting that on what we call our certificate of analysis, which is a lot-specific um, piece of information that will be attached to each product on the web page. But in the meantime, if you need that information, you can always call our tech support line, and they will gladly give you the information. We also indicate the specificity of the antibody, and this is especially relevant if there are family members that against the, uh, in the, against the target. And so we will clearly state, as best of our knowledge, 
that whether an antibody cross-reacts with a known isoform. Um, we also talk about the sensitivity and give you the antigen information. Finally, by default, on all of our data sheets where uh, an antibody is approved for Western blot, we will give a very quick piece of detail about the Western blotting conditions, and that includes the dilution, the blocking, and the primary conditions. And the reason for this is that some of our antibodies work really, really well in milk and really, really poorly in BSA and vice versa. And so by default, we test all of our antibodies by Western blot using both milk and BSA as the primary diluent. And when we do that, we get really divergent results. Now, sometimes it doesn't make any difference, but many times it makes a significant difference, especially for phospho-specific antibodies. And so we attempt to make that front and center a piece of detail that you can easily refer to to understand how to optimize your Western blot conditions. And so when using an antibody from any company, I encourage you to use a variety of different uh, buffer conditions uh, in order to optimize performance of the antibody. So why do we go through all of this effort to make the antibodies that we do? And part of the reason is that we've listened to our customers. We, our teams travel widely. We have over 250 active scientific collaborations uh, as of today. Um, and we, have, we host scientists all the time at our facility to come give talks. So we spend a lot of time talking to scientists to understand what it is they need, what it is they want, and how we can make uh, their antibody use more seamless. And we spend a lot of our money reinvesting back in our antibody development pipeline. And I think that CST is unique in the fact that because we're privately owned, we can do that. And so it's really great to be in an environment where we're developing new technologies, we are investing heavily in new platforms for antibody validation, and we are um, investing in the people that, in, that validate those antibodies. We take a pre-market, post-market approach to antibody selling, and that is that we engage scientists up front to understand what products we need to develop, but then in the end, we also need to continue to support those products by engaging customers to understand, is something not working right? What new applications do we need to try this, test this antibody for? How can we make this product better and meet new needs? Our antibody development process looks a lot like this, and I'm not going to go through this in a, in, in a whole lot of detail, but this is how we make a typical rabbit monoclonal antibody. It starts with target selection. We then design the project based on the application requirements, species requirements, et cetera. Um, we then immunize and bleed the animals. We go through a round of application testing. And again, the applications chosen at this point are dictated by the target of the antibody. For example, if we made a PDL1 antibody uh, for Western blot only, it probably wouldn't be that useful to investigators. So we make immunohistochemistry the primary driver for that reagent, and then we test that antibody by IHC up front. We then go through a series of molecular cloning steps to ensure that we're capturing the antibody. It goes through another round of, of application testing. Uh, to make sure that the clone that we selected early on, again, is the clone after recombinant cloning. There's a set of final clone selections, yet another round of application testing, and then that's when the product is developed and provided over to production um, to be made as a larger lot. That lot is then made and then tested by an independent group. So our production group and our development groups are independent. So the teams that are doing the lot testing are different from those that are doing all the development testing. So every product is being tested by at least two different teams before it goes out the door. And those teams have to agree on the quality of the product before we release it. I'd like to say that everything that we take on becomes a product, but that's not the case. So most of our, our well, almost half, of our antibody projects end up failing at some point during the process. So we actually throw away just as many projects as we end up making into products, which I think is a huge attrition rate, but it also goes to show how important our antibody principles and our validation steps are. Out of interest in time, I'm going to go through this very quickly, but in general, these are our antibody principles, validation principles. We determine specificity, sensitivity, consistency, we optimize the methods, and we provide high-quality tech support. And what I'd like to do is drill down in a little bit more detail about a couple of these. 
the first being sensitivity, the other being consistency. And so I want to show you some examples now of how we use specificity to validate antibodies. This table is designed to be an incomplete example of how we, the, some of the methods that we use to determine specificity. And I want to call to your attention specifically the use of positive or negative tissues or the use of knockouts to make sure that the antibody is specific. And by way of example, we're using immunofluorescence to look in positive and negative cell lines to make sure is the antibody specific. Now again, this particular experiment just shows the antibody is specific by immunofluorescence. It doesn't say anything about how it performs by Western blot. So you have to do the same specificity analysis that you would do by Western blot that you do in, in this example. And we never just do one method. We often use multiple methods to confirm specificity. For immunofluorescence in particular, and then sometimes for Western blotting, we'll use subcellular localization as an indicator of specificity. If you have a cytoplasmic protein and it stains the nucleus, then you probably don't have a specific antibody. We will also use cell fractionation to test antibodies by Western blot. But for the most part, anything that is not specific in localizations in one application, with that calls into the question results about the other applications, unless we can prove otherwise. Using agonists or inhibitors um, or growth conditions to shift a protein around is also critically important to validating an antibody. CST offers a wide array of phospho or modification-specific antibodies, and in these cases, we often, very often, use treatments to, in order to ensure, to convince ourselves that the the um, antibody is correct. Again, we will also use positive and negative cell lines, but the treatment uh, condition really gives us the, the, the right information that we're looking for. We often compare our products against those from other companies. Um, this was actually a product that I made. The top image of prostatic acid phosphatase was tested both by Western blot and by immunistic chemistry against the top competitor and the 4LJ clone, uh, which is sold by uh, or used in a, as a clinical diagnostic marker. And so we will often screen our, our antibodies against these competitors to see where do we stand. Is ours better, uh, worse, or the same as a competitor antibody? And oftentimes we will only sell it if it's, if it's an improvement on the market. Finally, we'll use other techniques, such in this case as using cell pellets to pre-screen for immunohistochemistry. And so what you're looking at here is the CST antibody highlighted in blue or a non-CST antibody, which is uh, on the right-hand side, in met positive cells in the top two boxes or met negative cells in the bottom three boxes um, using CST's new met anti-met antibody. And you can see that in our hands what we're seeing is nice specific staining uh, in the met positive cells, no staining in the met negative cells, whereas a competitor antibody stains equivalently, if not more so, in the negative cells. In terms of consistency, um, we take great, we go to great lengths to ensure that every lot of our product is exactly the same as the previous lot, so that if you're switching lots, you're not suddenly going to start getting new results. And this is just one of many examples that I have. This is a rabbit polyclonal antibody. It's one of our best-selling products, number 9101. Um, it's against phospho ERK. And what you can see in this image is that one of the very early lots that we made, this uh, clone uh, lot 10, rabbit polyclonal, was released in 1999. And I'm showing you examples of additional lots that were sold after that, that have since been retired. So lots made in 2000, 2002, et cetera. And you can see that at least by Western blot, every single lot, it looks exactly the same as all the other lots. We go through great lengths to make sure that our formulations are correct. And we would follow up by also testing all of these lots uh, by IF and by the other approved applications to make sure that the product performs equivalently at exactly the same dilution in every single application for which the product is approved. From a tech support question, as I've said many times, it's very important to go through um, if you're having an issue with one of our products, please call, and somebody will help you. You can also email or go to our website to submit a form. I want to spend a couple seconds talking about what others are doing to address reproducibility. And so there have been a really great number of, of initiatives that have been proposed. For example, 
There are now some reagent ID repositories, such as the RRID uh, system that's been proposed and being used by some journals. And there are also protocol sites. Uh, I'm just citing an example of Protocols IO, which is being used to track reagents, not only in labs, but in publications, and track the use of protocols. And I encourage you to check both of those out as a way of, of citing and reviewing protocols and reagents uh, in the literature and in your own work. A number of really good antibody search engines have become available. And again, ones that link to the vendor are probably best. The ones that, are, that offer to sell you a product are probably just resellers. But a lot of these engines do a really nice job of tying a product to a a, a number of citations or end user data. And I find that to be really useful in terms of finding out which antibodies are most widely used, most highly published, or um, highly, rate, highly recommended by others. Journals have started to make a slow change in terms of encouraging uh, better citations and better user behavior by implementing uh, checklists, making sure that authors are actually listing the antibodies correctly in current use of proper methods. I know Cell Press has launched STAR. I, as I mentioned above, some journals are working with the RRID group to ensure that RRIDs are used to cite antibodies. And there are a number of, of individual journals in which the editors have come out to say, you need to be more careful about how you list and cite your antibodies. The NIH has started a program of rigor and reproducibility and research and they've launched some efforts into finding ways to ensure greater reproducibility and greater accountability in research. CIDAB, a group out of the UK, launched a meeting uh, in, uh, earlier in, in 2016 to bring together scientists uh, and other vendors and um, journals to talk about antibody validation. But most importantly, the GBSI, which is, again, the Global Biological Standards Institute, recently held an antibody validation workshop as part of their reproducibility initiative. And they invited vendors, research scientists, journal editors, funding agencies, and antibody database experts and search repository um, leaders to come together to dis discuss what's wrong with antibody validation and what needs to be done to fix it. Out of that meeting came a number of initiatives. And one that I'd like to highlight again, as I've mentioned, is the need for greater reagent or resource identify, identification in the literature, um, et cetera. And so this is where I think RRIDs makes a huge impact um, on tracking not only the reagents that are used in papers, um, but eventually other information such as the lot, the dilution, things like that. Uh, the vendors are beginning to work with the GBSI to adopt a set of validation standards. And those are being worked on now, and so you'll have to stay tuned for those. But basically, um, the standards that they're coming up with, if you're familiar with the five pillars workflow uh, that was published earlier in, uh, this year in Nature Methods, um, or things that, that, to be honest, CST is already doing. We still have some work to do. But for the most part, we feel that we're already adhering to those validation standards. Um, we also make sure that we, we, we use detailed protocols. So that was another uh, topic of discussion at the GBSI meeting. And so we like to think that we're ahead of the curve on that, but again, can do a better job. We also, another top piece of topic that came out of the GBSI meeting was the need for vendors to show, to have increased transparency, to show more data, to talk about where the data, the antibody is derived from, so to make resellers, um, more accountable for what they're reselling, um, and to show more application-specific application validation data. Researchers, as I mentioned earlier, were uh, tasked with finding ways to better train or better mentor, the, especially the younger students in their lab, and to increase the use of the reagent identification resources that I mentioned earlier. So, until the working group comes up with guidelines, validation guidelines, I just want to close by offering a few of my, my own advice based on experience in my work here on how to find a good antibody. And it starts with looking at the data, reviewing the data, both for that provided by the vendor, any data, any publications where the antibody is used, albeit that that's difficult to find, but the search tools now are becoming better at doing that. 
and looking for how the antibody is validated. Does the vendor show testing data or validation data? And that's what is really critical. And you need to look at the applications that you're using. Because again, like I said, if there's one thing that you need to take away from this, it's that an, that an antibody works, if an antibody works in one application, it doesn't guarantee performance in another. And so you need to look, if you want to use an antibody for chip, was the antibody validated for chip? Does the data look like it's quality data? Did the vendor or the person who developed the antibody use the correct gene targets to validate their chip? You need to look at and review the data very, very clearly. And if the vendor doesn't show it, you should call them and ask them. You also want to check to make sure that the species reactivity is correct for the model that you're using. If a vendor sells an antibody and it was raised against human protein, there's no guarantee it will work for mouse. So you need to make sure that, that the vendor actually tested for mouse. And you can either look on their website, uh, CST makes this clearly available, or you should be able to call and find out. The vendor should provide protocols, especially application-specific protocols for how to use the antibody, preferably the dilution or a very tight dilution range, not um, it kills me when people say to determine by end user because that doesn't make any sense. You're having to redo a bunch of validation data for the vendor. And so I would suggest looking for vendors that not only offer specific protocols, but give you narrow ranges on how to use the antibody. Now, you're going to have to do some titration on your own end, especially for some applications, but for the most part, at least they can give you some guidance as to where to start and where to end. If it's important to you, you might want to look at the type of antibody. Um, recombinant antibodies tend to be, uh, at least rabbit and mouse recombinant antibodies tend to be much more reproducible than polyclonal antibodies. But if polyclonal is the only thing that's available, you want to see about the lot-to-lot -lot consistency. Is this something that you're going to make a big discovery on one day and find out that you can't reproduce it six months from now because the vendor is going to switch to a new lot? You may also want to review peer-reviewed citations, find out where the antibody was used, how it was used, if the vendor didn't approve the application you're looking for, did somebody else use it that way, um, can you find out any more information? Does the vendor offer technical support to be able to help you if you have a problem? And all companies should direct you right to a, somebody who can give you true technical support, not just send you a free tube of antibodies. I would also like to say that some reviews are helpful, but I would use these with caution because not all reviews, product reviews on websites are accurate. I prefer to use the ones in which somebody has actually supplied the data to go along with it. Uh, and so I would use those with a grain of salt. And with that, I will close and say that if anybody has any questions, I encourage you to either go ahead and email me directly. My email address is up on the screen. Or if you go to www.cellsignal.com and browse the About Us section of our, of our top navigation, we have a page dedicated to our antibody validation principles. And now and in the future, there will be a lot more detail um, about our validation processes, the transparency that we are going to implement, and some of the changes that we're going to make in the way that we do our antibody validation. Because like I said, we're not perfect, but we are, we think, um, right where we need to be in terms of high quality product development and uh, distribution. So with that, I will close and say thank you to everyone. Hey, well, thank you so very much for that informative presentation. Now, before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. <clears throat> Our first question, for monoclonals, do you provide the epitope sequence information? Do you provide information about cross-relativity of epitopes overlap? Example, AB that binds to a protein epitope versus another that binds to the same region when phosphorylated. Yeah, so we've started doing a lot more of that now. I think as it's become clear that post-translational modifications that occur very, very closely to each other can affect antibody binding. If you're trying to detect one post-translational modification and, um, and there's another nearby post-translational modification, it might change. We do, um, for most 
for our antibodies that are raised against peptides, if you, we are going to make those peptide sequences available on our website. Currently, they are not. We give you the information about the region around which the antibody was designed. But if you call our tech support line, they will give you that info. They will provide that, that information to our academic customers. The reason we don't is because there's proprietary issues around the antigen design and things like that. But for the most part, to our academic researchers, this is not a problem. The, the answer to the question is that we use a number of techniques to determine the specificity of antibodies that are uh, near multiple PTMs. Uh, the first is that we've been using for a while now antibody arrays in which we spot, a, um, sorry, peptide arrays in which we spot a number of different peptides, each containing a different uh, iteration of the post-translational modifications in that region. We spot the peptides at varying concentrations and then use the antibody to determine its specificity. The other way we do this is to uh, make either uh, knockouts. So uh, we've done this for a number of projects where we'll make um, you know, uh, serine to alanine mutations or you know, other mutations to try to see if the antibody still reacts with the protein um, when we mutated or otherwise modified the site. And so I hope that our, our antibodies, we try to make as specific as possible using as many methods as we possibly can. In some cases, it's very, dif very difficult, but we do, we do our best, and we will provide this information if it's needed. <clears throat> Thank you. What are some differences that you've experienced with recombinant antibodies and monoclonal antibodies? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, yes, I apologize. What are some of the differences you've experienced with recumbent antibodies and monoclonal antibodies? Ah, oh, yes, good question, thank you. Um, so recombinant, again, is all that we've done is taken the, the antibody and expressed it in a hetero heterologous system. And what we find with uh, antibodies derived from hybridomas, whether it's a mouse or rabbit, is that there's some lot-to-lot -lot variability. Um, mouse monoclonals in hybridoma are relatively stable, but rabbit monoclonals are, are much less so. And so what we find when we develop the recombinant clone is that we get much greater consistency, lot-to-lot -lot performance uh, goes, goes way up, and we don't risk uh, actually losing the antibody um, due to the crash of the, um, of the hybridoma. So we're going in that direction because um, it, it makes our reagents a lot more consistent. But in terms of performance by application, we found that there is no uh, recombinant antibodies. Let me put it this way. There's no evidence to suggest that a recombinant antibody performs any better than a traditional monoclonal antibody. Um, in any application. You still have to validate a recombinant antibody. You have to test every lot because there can be, depending on how you culture your cells, differences from lot to lot, um, which is why we make all of our recombinant antibodies under very carefully controlled um, circumstances. But um, for the most part, when you hear people say that recombinant antibodies are better, I'm not sure that there's evidence to support that. Production and manufacture is easier, but they're not necessarily any better than their counterparts. And some people actually argue that polyclonals, because they recognize multiple motifs, actually give you greater performance in some applications. And, 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 I, and I would buy that argument. Thank you. I use anti-mouse antibodies to study um, antigen in lizard kidney. Is this uh, result valid or no? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes. I use anti-mouse antibodies to study antigen in lizard kidney. Is the result valid or no? Um, uh, I don't have enough experience to be able to answer that question. Sorry. <laughs> not a problem. Thank you. For antibodies that are not available, does CST welcome suggestions for antibody targets to be designed? Absolutely. So we, um, I can't bring up the website right now, but we do have a place on our website where you can suggest a new target. Uh, 
or if you can contact your sales representative. The way that it works is that our sales representatives will take those suggestions and um, bring them to our development scientists who will, who will then consider them. My question is related to the spec sheet and reagent use for validation. And most of the CST One moment here, apologize. Oh, I apologize. Um, the question is, how, how can we address a, a use the CST antibody in R01 application as a part of the scientific rigor? Yeah, so it is my understanding. That's a good question. My, it's my understanding that the NIH Office of Re Rigor and Re um, Reproducibility is uh, engaging a new system in grants in which they're uh, more highly vetted. And so my, my guess is that in the very near future, grants are going to have to include some sort of validation data for some of the, the materials being used. Um, I don't know, I don't remember, there was a conversation around this very issue, um, but I honestly don't remember what the outcome of that discussion was, whether or not the vendor data would be sufficient. Uh, I think that the reason it wouldn't be is that if the vendor hasn't tested the antibody in the application and the cell line or tissue that you plan on using, that the vendor data would not be sufficient. So, for example, if, if we show uh, or the vendor shows uh, reactivity in HeLa cells and you're using uh, mouse brain samples, um, you may actually have to show that the antibody validates in mouse brain instead of providing the vendor data unless the vendor data has done that experiment for you. Can you also write the IHC antibody or test on automated system and maybe share the protocol as well? That's, that's a, another terrific question. We historically um, have not used auto standards only because we don't have access to one. Um, we are in the next few weeks about to bring in an auto standard to CST and we'll start to validate some of our IHC antibodies for use in an auto stainer and we'll make that, um, that application uh, and the protocols available to, uh, on the website um, and upon request if anybody needs it. Are there any instances where the choice of the secondary has consequences on the quality of the result? And do you always use the same one, and do you do any testing with multiple antibodies? That's another good question. So at CST, as we're doing the testing process, we use our own secondary antibodies so that we don't have to buy them from anybody. Does the secondary antibody make a difference? Absolutely. The dilution that you use a secondary antibody um, in, especially for Western blotting, the, the dilution um, makes a huge impact on the signal-to-noise ratio, on um, how dirty the, the, the background is. And we do occasionally, we'll test uh, our, our competitors' uh, secondary antibodies. We typically don't make that information available. We do it for our own purposes. Um, but in general, yes, the choice of a secondary antibody and how you use it uh, makes a huge difference, and I would recommend that the first time you use a new antibody, you should also do a, a titration with your secondary to make sure that you're using that an, op, an, an optimal concentration as well. And can you talk briefly about the role of buffers and its important in IHC and link it with the retrieval solutions, please? Absolutely. So it, we find very often that um, we can, the, the difference between an antibody working or not working is entirely due to a number of factors. The fixation conditions, the age of the, the fixative, so how fresh your buffers are, um, the antigen retrieval methods, uh, and the conditions in, under which you do antigen retrieval. All of these have a huge impact. Um, we've worked with a number of, of large clinical labs that when they're doing clinical trials often see wide variability in the antibody staining pattern because there's no consistency over how the antibody 
or how the material was fixed, the age, uh, how long it sat in the fixative. We find these to be really, really critical components in the, how an antibody performs in an IHC assay. IHC and validation by IHC is, is almost kind of its own universe. Um, people that do a lot of IHC will tell you that you really need to validate a, an IHC antibody from scratch in your system. We do as much as we possibly can to facilitate that. And so one thing that we do do if you're doing IHC is that we do make available control slides that will allow you to, that we have tested internally with our own antibody so that you can take those control slides and run them through your own protocol with our antibody to make sure that our antibody is still working. So I encourage you to use vendors that do that kind of thing. We also provide lysate controls for Western blots and things like that as a way of controlling for sample preparation variability that occurs. <clears throat> My question now is related to the spec sheet and the agents used for validation, and most of the CST spec sheet, only CST reagents mentioned, such as dilutants and detection reagents. Do you use most commonly used reagents, such as Mazin PBS and dilutant or different secondary reagents? We use pretty common uh, buffers. A few of our antibodies work in, in buffers that are specific for them, and we typically call them out. Uh, on our website, uh, under the, there's a, on each product page, there's an accordion that talks about, there, that you can open that talks about the protocols. And in that, within that area, you can actually find out more details about the buffer compositions that are used. Um, for some of our reagents where that's not indicated, um, I would call our tech support line and they can give you that information. Um, we don't, we don't make, none of the, the buffers are trade secret. Um, situation. So we're, we're, we're pretty open with that. Thank you. And what type of malayan cell lines are recommended for validating antibody specificity um, using CRISPR? Oh, yeah, so that's a good question. We like, we typically like to use uh, a cell line. Uh, we use many of the, the known genomic proteomic databases to find cells that are predicted to express high levels of our protein of interest. Ideally, we like to use those cell lines um, to knock down uh, using CRISPR. And the reason for that is that um, some of the model systems that are, that are available out there, such as the, 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 cell, the CRISPR line from Haplogen, um, those cell lines, which we've used in-house, um, don't express all proteins. And so you're going to get a negative signal and should get a negative signal in both the wild type and the knockdown cells. So we prefer to use um, the, the uh, human cell lines that are predicted to express decent levels of the protein, maybe not super high because then it makes the CRISPR harder, but um, that we can confirm by Western blot express uh, a good amount of the protein of interest and that then we can use CRISPR to knock that down, uh, down or out completely. And Doctor, do you have any final comments for today? I don't. I would just say that if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, my new job here at CST is to um, uh, keep tabs on the reproducibility initiative and to make sure that we're supporting our customers in any way possible to make sure that their work is reproducible. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to email me. Um, if there are questions after the webinar, I, I would encourage the same. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Cell Signaling Technology, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through April of 2017. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We'll invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.